Let's give another big thank you to those panelists. Such an engaging discussion. You filled us with a lot of ideas to take back and employ in our educational ventures. We have our next topic of discussion, educators and their organizations as forces of social change. In our fast-paced world, the role of educators has become increasingly important as they do not only impact knowledge, but also serve as advocates for change in our communities. Our panel of experts will explain, will explain this topic. We have Serena Chang, co-founder and chief product officer at Impello, Arlene Limas, CEO of Pay Prevention, Lindsay Messaline, director and lead teacher at Collaborative Voices Initiative, Charmaine Utz, CEO and relational DEI expert of Living Unapologetically, Dr. Rita L. Thornton, CEO and founder of Dr. Rita Hearts Ablaze Ministries, and Dr. Rose Suzanne D. Barty, PhD, department chair and professor of U University of Central Florida. Let's welcome our panelists. Hello. Hey, y'all. Good morning. Right before lunchtime. Uh, I'm Charmaine Utz. I'm today's moderator. And we're going to talk about social change. And before we do that, there's a couple things that I want to share. One, you should have had a handout given to you that describes who we are. We're hoping to save a little bit of time with intros and not, um, you know, tell our stories. You can read some of them, and of course, you can connect with us after. Um, as the moderator, I'm not going to take up too much airspace, but I do want to start with a very short, very real story that ends with an invitation for you all to join us in this space. <clears throat> this is a real story. I'm not making this up for this situation. On the way here, on the flight here, I was sitting next to a woman who wasn't well, um, and she started saying a lot of slurs. Just a lot of slurs, a lot of racial slurs, and various things. And I don't think that that's, you know, terribly uncommon in today's world. It just, it was a lot. And it took a lot of effort for the people around her, myself included, to not act. But I think the, the most surprising thing to me is she was so unwell, we actually had to go back to the gate and have her removed from the plane. She started getting violent and throwing things. <clears throat> and what really stood out to me is as they were taking her off the plane, I had to get up and everybody was recording. Everybody was recording. Now, I, my first instinct might be, okay, well, maybe they're recording to make sure everyone's gonna be safe. But that was not the case. I know that wasn't the case because I heard everybody talking. People wanted to record it to tell the story about what they witnessed so that they could have a story. When I sat down, people said, you had the best seat. You might get on TV. And I'm like, this is not, this is not the best seat. I don't, I don't want to be on TV like this. What are you talking about? And it stood out to me because I realized it's so easy for us to look at a situation and be so removed from it like we're not in it. Everybody was in the situation, but they weren't. They just stood behind the camera waiting for their next story to tell, waiting to be able to post it. And I even saw people calling, sending the videos to, to share what they saw without recognizing the impact on the people that actually experienced it. So my invitation to you all today is to be with us in this space. I, I know the stories of the women up here who are going to share a lot with you and know that in addition to all of the great things going on, there's a lot of struggle and pain that contributed to the success and how they know the things they know. And so that's it, that's the invitation. Be here with us. Um, and that's it, y'all. So I wanna start with the first question. And I wrote it down so I did not forget. Oh yes, yeah. so how did y'all positively, how are you positively 
impacting social change. If you could share a short story, a statistic, just something that stands out to you, what would that be? And who wants to go first? Sure, I can start. <laughs> I guess we're on a panel to speak, right? I'm Lindsay Mazeline. Hi, I've been a teacher for 23 years. Uh, the last few years I've dedicated uh, to formerly and currently incarcerated learners. So I have been teaching at Rikers Island, uh, the very infamous, notorious jail in New York City. It is as bad as it looks, if not worse, uh, from what you see on TV. Um, I teach foundational reading, writing, math, uh, GED, and high school completion for incarcerated, or I should say detained learners at Rikers. Um, Rikers is actually 85% uh, people awaiting trial, so they haven't even been convicted. And just last week, the 21st person died uh, at that facility just this year. Um, so one of the ways I, <laughs> I'm really doing my best to uh, enact social change is to connect with learners. I know the first workshop we had, or the first panel, was Learners on the Margins. And walking into Rikers Island, there is, I cannot find more margins than that, like more marginalized, more minoritized, more racialized than the students at Rikers. It's right across the way from LaGuardia Airport as well. So it's like, here is this ultimate freedom, let me go and travel, and here's this ultimate lack of freedom. Um, so it starts for me with representation. Like how do my learning materials as an educator connect to my learners? connect to these students who have been pushed so far to the, to the margins. And I would say it starts with representation um, because we see, you know, historically and traditionally and even currently, our learners' voices, our community's voices, our colleagues' voices are being silenced, are being excluded, are being banned from classrooms, from books, from learning materials. And so it starts with representation. How do I bring stories that connect to my learners? And then to go beyond that, what can we put into our learning materials that actually empowers our learners? It's not about giving a voice to the voiceless. No one is voiceless. But how do I put this microphone that I have been given under the voice of these voices that are ignored, excluded, oppressed, pushed down? What can I do in these incredibly marginalized and very sad settings to bring joy and life and excitement and engagement? for learning. So representing, but then also empowering, helping learners find that voice, connect with that voice, and find their place in an educational system that has very much not been built for them, and not only that, but has been built to specifically oppress them. So find that voice, empower that voice, and find that journey. Thank you for saying that. that. That means a lot, too, coming from a white woman who's like, hey, you know what? Uh, maybe I should talk a little less. So I, I appreciate you saying that. It, it's a compliment. Yes. Well, I am a daughter of the South. I was born and reared in Mississippi in the home of two loving parents. And through Mississippi, I came to understand a lot about what it means to live. Through Mississippi, by way of Illinois, by way of Washington, D.C., back to Mississippi, back to Washington, D.C., back to Mississippi, and now in the state of Florida. My education and my career trajectory has taken me across the country. And what I have come to understand in all of those places, and in fact, it became reaffirmed just before I came on stage today, as you were saying about a real story. My late father who's deceased and he would have been on the phone to my brother text me and he said do you have time to talk and whenever I get those text messages no matter where I am I somehow find time to talk so I stepped out of the room or in the corner there and he said we have to listen to mama because we got to celebrate mama and what mama had done was to identify school sites the segregated school sites in our community have now, are being now considered as landmarks within the state of Mississippi. And so why do I tell you that story? Because through that story is my story. One that is based upon commitment to what excellence is and what excellence does. And in my role as a university professor, now a department chair, 
That's what I'm committed to, getting my students, getting faculty and staff who want to see something different, be something different, helping them to realize whatever potentials, whatever purpose that lie within each of them. And so I'm committed to doing that and have been able to do that, especially with my doctoral students who may be the first in their families to get a doctoral degree and the joy that that brings to their families and how that trajectory has now been changed. In fact, I still carry this text message, all oh, those text messages on my phone today. And it's a text message from Adrian. And Adrian sent me a text message. She said, Dr. Barty, ever since you came here, my life has changed. My life has changed because before I was only considered to be a number, but you made me feel like a person. You cared because before I had been treated as if I was inhuman, but because of you, I'm able to complete. Well, that story doesn't end there. About two weeks prior to graduation, we had gotten Adrian to completion. I got another phone call this time, and the call was that Adrian had suffered a brain aneurysm. And so my dear Adrian did not even get to walk across the stage to receive her doctorate. But what, what I'm reminded of is that test message that I still carry to, with me to this day, four years later, that she did get to complete. And by virtue of our interactions, she was able to see life differently. And so when I think of social justice, I think about being that one who stands in the gap. And I tell my students all of the time, let me take the hits for you. Just follow my lead because I have done the work and now I'm trying to prepare you and propel you to the next level. And by doing so, it changes the life stories. It changes the life trajectories through the interactions with me and my role as a department chair, as a professor, because I understand what it means when you're talking about access and, and opportunity. It means making a difference in the lives of someone else. I'll go next. Um, Arlene Limas, how am I impacting social change? Um, I'm trying to make the world a safer place. I do not think we can reach our full potential if we are not given a community that is safe, a workplace that is safe, a school that is safe. Um, so it's a little bit of my Trojan horse, but I am trying to impact people with human safety skills, pay prevention. We are trying to impact people with human safety skills that allows them to maneuver this world safely. How to set a boundary, how to identify inappropriate coercion, how to have an intuition muscle that is developed and built, how to use your voice. And so if we can do this at the workplace level, um, where we do most of our adult learning, then that skill set can be used inside of work, outside of work, at the grocery store, uh, in interactions with our family. Um, so this is how am I, how it seems like a lofty goal, but this is how I am trying to make the world a safer place. My name is Dr. Rita Thornton, and uh, um, how you, my organization uh, positively uh, has an impact is that um, we all know that there's been a very uh, much rise in violence and bullying, uh, whether that bullying is in the workplace, whether it's in uh, that workplace is in a school, uh, a business or a church, but no one is covering the devastation that happens after the bully has done the abuse. So um, I have uh, designed this three-point approach um, as far as positively looking at the social change. And that is working with businesses um, who want to make a change, who want to change the way we address a social problem. And that social problem being abuse in the workplace, bullying in the workplace, 
um, and working with those businesses to see how they can change how they address that bullying. And the second point of the um, approach is that we've learned that you have to get that bullying person out of the environment immediately because they have traumatized the entire workplace and you really don't know how much um, uh, that has affected. So um, I created this uh, leadership style uh, where we look at how long it takes to remove the source of the trauma and the traumatized employees and then looking at what is their personal safety, focusing more on their well-being and collectively working that together because um, due to COVID, a lot of things have changed, especially with dealing with social issues. As I said, whether it, those issues, those social problems are in the workplace of a church, uh, a business, um, or a school. But you know, no one ever goes back to see the devastation that has occurred after that bully has done whatever they have done. And that's what I'm focusing on. How do you educate people who have been traumatized? How do you get them to get back to looking at their well-being and their public, and their actual personal safety so they can learn again and feel safe in working in that area? So that is my focus as far as um, that positive impact because no one is looking at the effects that that bully has had um, and educating people to know that they can get back to healing. And I'm all about uplifting people because I've learned, been in that situation before, is that the best way of healing is to uplift other people. And when you uplift other people, that's how you start your healing process. So the learning and the leadership style that I'm introducing is focusing on, we're about uplifting people and healing people from that abuse, whether it is bullying um, or uh, abuse in the workplace. So that's how we're working with that social change. Good morning, everyone. All right, thank you. So my name is Serena Chang. I am co-founder and chief product officer for Impello. Uh, we are a startup that is really committed to uh, developing integral or whole person education as it applies to professional development. And this is actually my second social venture. Uh, and it's been really exciting to kind of see it grow. And I'd like to just take a moment to expand upon more about Impello, because it really is a shared vision of myself and my co-founder in terms of how we really want to grow individuals and really provide a platform and a community that enables social change. So my passion is really around integral or whole person education and connecting that with our wonderful panel from before it's really focusing on the self, right? Understanding that we're all individual, we're all unique. We all also want to connect and belong. And in the way that we develop, it happens along so many different facets. Um, our educational system really focuses on intellectual development. But uh, with integral education and the model that I'm building, again, it really emphasizes emotional, spiritual, psychological, and even for many of our students, it might be faith and religious intelligences. And it's really kind of bringing that into creating kind of social change within our learners. And for my co-founder, you know, from the day that I met him about seven or eight years ago, his passion has always been about creating access, about building bridges. And what that really means for the learners and the visuals that we're serving is to really to create opportunity and to create growth pathways for however that individual wants to move forward. 
you know, for our learners, some of them want to really advance forward in their professional careers. For some of them, they want to really grow their community and be able to you know, provide for their families. And then for some of them, it's really to just kind of build a stronger sense of self and be able to move more authentically in who they are uh, in the world. And what I just want to really close by saying is, you know, with the shared vision of my co-founder and I, you know, Impello is really committed to creating transformation in professional development through self-transformation. The program that we've created, or the learning experience we've created, is called Self Design Studio. Uh, we currently offer it as either a 10 or 15 week semester long learning program or as an intensive three to five day workshop. And briefly, Self-Design Studio is taught as a learning community, as well as it really honors right, the growth pathways of each individual self. And it's a process. Self-Design Studio starts with discovery. Uh, we really focus on each learner just taking some time to reflect, asking those questions, writing, drawing, or even singing, you know, much more about who they are beyond their own professional selves. Uh, they also do a 360 degree assessment where they really bridge out and speak to a wide spectrum of people in their lives, professional, family, coaches, maybe those students and professors who, you know, really, really were inspirations for us to get more insights on themselves. That moves into the second stage of our program, which is integration, where again, the students really integrate some of these insights, or could be challenging questions that come up through their discovery process, and start to really imagine or recreate who they want to be professionally and career-wise. And then finally, our self-designed studio process ends with design. And we ask each of the students to really create, right, who their professional brand is, who they want to be as themselves, and we work closely with them in terms of how to promote themselves. So anyway, with Impello, we're really committed to social change uh, because we are committed to really creating self-growth as a transformation pathway for people's professional development. Thank you all so, so much. Um, I wasn't going to say anything, but I want to say something brief. And he's, yeah. <laughs> Um, I am, I'm a relational diversity, equity, and inclusion expert. And one of the things that I do in that space is help people not just learn what to do, not figure out the, the do's and the don'ts and the checklists and the steps. It's how to do something with the information that we're learning, how to struggle and feel and understand self in order to engage with others. Um, and I do that by modeling a lot. And what I wanted was model something because I realized, even though, even though I do this work a lot, I am not perfect, so I like to model when I don't get things right. And what I did was, Lindsay, I don't know what your background is. I look at you, you present, or I read you as a white person, and I just you know, called you a white person. I don't know if you are or not. You could be, and, and that's fine. Okay, but I didn't even know and I just assumed, so I just wanted to own that I could have very well just named what you were and I didn't even, I didn't even know. So that was my bad, but I was right, so no harm done. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I just wanted to model what it looks like. I do this all of the time. Uh, I do it because that is what people are asking for. They don't know what change looks like in practice, so I literally use myself as much as possible as a conduit, as a way for people to see what it looks like and then I hold them accountable to try it out. All right, y'all. I think another good question is, what do you feel like is the next big thing to integrate in education to impact social change? Like, what's the next big thing? So I'll, I'll jump in there. Um, I think that um, individual empowerment, like everyone has spoken about on here, uh, and the other panels have spoke about is customized training, customized learning, individual empowerment. I think that has to be the next step. We need to give the individual the tools to keep themselves safe, um, to identify um, 
bad behavior. Uh, and we need to impart this in a way. I think part of the success that PAVE is having is for a particular reason. And that reason is, is we use training that is while we are in an adrenalized state. So much like you used your learning example right now, like, hey, this just happened. Um, so we had an incredible opportunity in the city of Oakland to partner with the city of Oakland that's created a new community responder program to respond to low equity calls, drunk in public, sleeper in my doorway, uh, and it's housed under the fire department. So it has nothing to do with the police department. But we provided the training for that community responder in how to handle when you are adrenalized and what you bring to that situation when you're adrenalized. You may be bringing to that situation something that happened 10 years ago because you're adrenalized. So it's important that we start understanding that we bring our whole self, unfortunately and fortunately, to every situation we move into. And so we have to acknowledge what that is. We need to have conversations around what that is. And we need to have, it needs to be okay to make mistakes. We heard yesterday and today that you know failure is its best is our best learning tool. So you know normalizing mistakes and having conversations, real conversations around intent, uh, and I think acknowledging, asking the simple question, what's going on here? Why am I entering into this situation adrenalized? What bias am I bringing into this situation? So uh, yeah, please. So I love that. Um, for me, you know, as Charmaine said when we first started, oh, to confirm, I'm like half Irish, half Lithuanian, so yeah, it's fine. <laughs> um, but as Charmaine said as we started, you know, we had met, you know, prior, obviously, as many of the panels I'm sure did, and just learned each other's stories. And um, our colleague here also said, you know, we're whole human beings, and Arlene just said it. We show up fortunately, unfortunately, you know, as our whole selves. So for me, that the piece as an educator, as a teacher, as a curriculum designer is storytelling. Like we all have a story. If I sit here and ask you, how did you get here today? We've been hearing some of these stories on the panels um, and we've seen these incredible bios and like flipping through this magazine being like, wow, these people are amazing. What am I doing here? No, but this idea of what is your story? What brought you here? Um, what did bring like a, you know, super white girl from Oregon to the l worst jail in America? And, um, but people have all, often ask me what my story is, you know? I do look like a Barbie doll. I've been called Barbie my whole life. I love it. But my story has often been interesting. What is your story as a teacher? How did you get there? Wow, you go to Rikers. You know, people are always so excited to hear my story. But my students, nobody gives a beep about their stories. And they have internalized that message that no one cares about their story. Their story is not important. Their story is criminal. Their story is this label, this one thing, and that's it. And so, you know, the first project that I did with Collaborative Voices, which is the organization I run, was to create a writing book. It's really for the GED, but it's also for foundational reading, writing, um, and, you know, reading comprehension. And I'll tell a quick story and then pass it on. But I had a, a student, you know, I walk into the jails and everyone's like, can we help you? Like, what are you doing here? And, and the first class, you know, I'm like, hey, everybody, who's ready for some learning? That's literally how I talk. Um, and one of the students first, he came up to me and said, you know, hey, miss, thanks for coming in, but I don't, with education. It's, I don't, I don't want to go to school, but don't, don't talk to me about school. And I said, that's fine. I have some coloring pages here. If you want to, you know, do that, that's fine. And as he's coloring, I start just kind of asking questions about his story. And little by little, we obviously built that connection. A lot of people throughout the conference have talked about making that connection with your students. But long story short, I gave him a few pages from the book. And I said, just take a look at it this week. I'll be back next week, see what you think. And it was about like, uh, I think the first question was, what's your name? Who gave you your name? Was it someone in your family, friends, community, yourself? Um, do you like your name? If you could change your name, what would it be? And then it had this entire piece on naming ceremonies in uh, tribal nations, the Nanticoke, Lenny Lenape tribal nation, how they name their community members. And I came back the following week. I didn't say anything. And he comes up to me. He's like, hey, Miss L, Miss L, where did you get those papers? Like, what, what were those papers? I said, well, it comes from this book that we wrote. And he's like, wait, what? And he said, if I had ever seen anything like this in school, I probably wouldn't have dropped out. 
And I hate the term dropout. I say they're pushed out. Students are pushed out of our schools. They do not drop out of our schools. But I saw the, the, this idea that like, wow, my story matters. My name is important to someone. That's part of my learning process. I left a book with him. I was gone for about three weeks. I came back. I am not joking. This student inside of Rikers Jail had completed a 154-page textbook in three weeks. Somebody who a week prior had told me, I don't care about education. But centering his story, making him feel seen and heard, lit him on fire, and he eventually graduated with his GED inside the jail. So, yeah, storytelling, empowering our learners, making them feel heard, seen, and valued. And, you know, part of it, too, has to be a commitment of both higher education and K-12 sectors providing a pathway, or some would like to call it a, pipe, a pipeline. But I see a pathway because there are multiple directions in which it can occur in terms of moving students through one phase to the other. And that way we can increase the graduation rates, we can increase the um, degree completion rates in, in, within colleges and universities. And so there's a need to draw a closer synergy between those particular areas so that students will have a plan where they are to go. I do believe in an individualized education plan that should be given for students, and not just when you're talking about instruction, but also when you're talking about life, but showing them the best possibility, be it through the college pathway or maybe it's vocational ed, but it has to be a pathway that can be provided, that can be offered as a directive so that they will understand what the next steps are because oftentimes it is not as evident to them because they may not have seen folk in their families who are doing these kinds of, who have access to these kinds of opportunities. But those of us who sit in those seats, we can provide that for them. We can bring it to them and their families because clearly given the level of expertise that we have, it is important and it behooves us to share that kind of knowledge, not in the sense of using the position from a place of um, superiority, but using the position from a place of shared collaboration because I'm wanting the best for the person or the persons and families involved. And so I think that that close connectivity between the K-12 sector where we are teaching and learning there and then higher education where we can move them toward degree completion because it's also going to affect their overall earning earning power and potential by getting them into a pathway that is beneficial not only for themselves but it can change the direction of their families and so that's where I see um, as needing to happen more in order that we can ultimately provide the kinds of opportunities that our students can have and the kinds of um, options that they will have made available to them. Thanks so much for yeah. that. Um, and I really want to connect what Lindsay, Arlene, and Ruth Susan just offered. Mm -hmm. you know, what I really heard was, you know, we're in an age where to really push education forward, it does need to be about self and individual empowerment. Uh, a strong part of that is telling our story, right? Whether it's our culture, whether we're the white girl from Oregon that's in New York now, um, and creating pathways. Um, and to really speak specifically to that, you know, I think with Impello and Self Design Studio, you know, our core purpose is really about the student and self-development. Uh, firstly, who they are as a person and what their purpose and values are. So much about the learning experience that we've created with Self Design Studio is for each individual to <coughs> learn more or connect more with themselves, whether it's through self-reflection, through supportive, as well as critical peer feedback, you know, working really closely with our Impello facilitators so that students can come through and be much more clear about their purpose, their values, and also, you know, where they kind of want to move forward, you know, in this world. Um, and a big part of that is in helping our students really kind of create their professional brand, you know, absolutely is storytelling. Where do they come from culturally? Where do they come from geographically? You know, what 
connects them with the world right now, what scares them with the world right now. And you know, the storytelling has just been such an immense part of the experience that we've created because it allows people to really show up more as a whole person, both in front of our community as well as you know, the communities, the professional networks, their families, you know, as they, they really move forward. Um, so yeah, I just really wanted to recap by saying um, that you know, I think the next big step within education is providing growth and support for uh, individuals to really chart their pathway forward, you know, both with purpose as well as to really navigate kind of this world that is very much you know, a changing world you know, as it is. Uh, for me, the, the next big step is to identify um, businesses and organizations that want to make the change. Um, to me, that is what's common uh, for all of these ladies up here, including myself, is the fact that it all starts with wanting to make the change and identifying there's a need to make the change because you can have all these ideas about um, social change and social problems, but if there's no desire to make that change, then it's basically worthless. So I publicly have to thank all of the ladies here because that is what, to me, is the common thread that runs through all of our organizations. It starts with wanting to make that change, and that's including myself as well. When you get an organization that wants to make a change about whatever social problem that they're faced with, that's the first and foremost, and that's the biggest thing. You can go from there when there is a desire to make that change. Yeah, Y'all, thank you. Uh, I, I just want to contribute by saying I, I think that I see that the next best, best thing or the biggest thing where I'm focusing my time and attention is taking an over-intellectualized cognitive topic like diversity, equity, inclusion, and making it much more relatable by building people's affective capacity. So building people's capacity to be in process-oriented spaces where it doesn't have to be super structured, logistical, follow the steps. So process-oriented spaces, emotion spaces, that is how you can build better relationship with self and then others. And that is the place that is ignored the most. People want to learn information and then get to behavior change or systems change. And it doesn't always do that. It's really hard to do that because it has to filter through our bodies and our emotions in self and with others before we can start to change. So I really, really believe that the biggest thing is to focus on building capacity, not just in the people that we serve, but in the people that educate too. It is really hard to get people to see themselves, students, whoever it is, children, adults. It's hard to get that change in other people when you're leading it from a place of not being able to do it yourself. So I actually really focus on the people that are leading other people, teaching other people, and developing that capacity there. And you know, your statement reminds me of, and we perhaps heard this before, that your IQ, your intellectual quotient, will get you there, but your EQ, your emotional quotient will keep you there. And so I think that's very important as leaders because nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And that part of how much you care has to do with one's demonstration of emotional intelligence in these roles because clearly we understand the science behind what we're doing. We understand our disciplines. But when it comes to being able to connect with people and really create a context for transformational change, that's when it's happening. That's the emotional piece that I think you just so um, creatively and innovatively described. And that's the part that oftentimes we don't, I don't believe we do enough of in terms of promoting because we want to be the ones with all of the answers. We want to be the ones who be the first in certain places and things. But the question is, can we sustain it? And it comes through sustainability by having a healthy emotional state of mind. 
if I could just add on to that, yes, on, on, on this, um, this emotional training and this emotional education, but we also have the science now that shows when young people or people of all ages come through a traumatic event, violence-based traumatic event, we have real epigenetic switches that are flipped. And it impacts the future, especially of children. It affects how they learn. It affects their proclivity to being sick. It, um, how much they can earn in, in future jobs, how they can become domestic violence perpetrators. It, it, it's proof, we have it now. So if we can find the training and the skill set that helps flip those epigenetic switches so to more resilience and, I mean, we have the data now and we have the research. Now we have to partner that with what can flip those switches. What training, what programming, what is going to help this happen so that the we call it the dominoes from falling. How do we disrupt those dominoes and flip those switches? All right, y'all. Well, thank you so, so much. This was a really great conversation. I recognize that we are almost at time. So I, I want to honor y'all. Is there anything y'all want to say or do we want to, maybe someone has a question. <laughs> y'all okay? Anyone have one question because it's just one? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you for that question. I would love to <laughs> answer and then share the floor as well. I, that is such an important question. And with culture, right, it means so many different things now. Culture can mean, again, the countries we're from, you know, the languages we speak, the food and, you know, kind of etiquette that we share. But, you know, in a world where we're also kind of hybrid, we're also online, there's also the whole culture of how do we interact in all these different modes and mediums of communication that we have. And one way we really invite this in with Impello is to create a learning community that is both very open as well as supportive. Um, from the get-go with any of our learning communities, we ask everyone to tell their story and to share about their culture. Um, this might be, uh, we had one student who was of Muslim origin, and during the time we last offered our self-designed studio program, it was actually in the middle of Ramadan. And in Ramadan, you stop eating at sunrise, you fast, and then you start eating again at sunset. And the timing of our class was usually right before he could start eating again. So during Ramadan, this poor student towards the end of class, we'd see him start, you know, kind of unfocusing. You know, he was, um, he was just getting hungry, low blood sugar. And what the students collectively did was we would stop as we saw the student, you know, start to just need to collect himself. And everyone would, quote unquote, offer him some virtual food. We'd just take a moment, kind of connect in and also really honor, right, his cultural and faith, you know, kind of heritage, you know, in, in, you know, in really honoring Ramadan. And, you know, the last thing I would really say about cultural importance is, you know, with our learning experiences, we found that if we have, you know, Impello facilitators, <coughs> you know, if we really create a strong learning community through our self-designed studio, People bringing in their cultural differences, which are really similarities, has gone such a long way in helping each student learn more about themselves. Because the different cultural lenses open up new questions, different reflections, which we might not be able to see because we're used to viewing ourselves in a certain way. Um, so such an important question, and I think really opening up the CQ, or the cultural quotient, uh, it's an important part of really kind of bringing forward education. And I would add 
cultural capital. Cultural capital. Cultural capital. <laughs> cultural capital, and that's what much of my research has been on. My first book was why, um, school, it was called School Matters, Why African American Students Need Multiple Forms of Capital. And that research was based out of Chicago and looking at students who were attending this high performing high school had different sets of experiences that helped to move them from that high school on into highly selective colleges and universities. And so the idea, around that cultural capital is an asset-based model and using culture to move them beyond. So for example, one who has a skill in music and how do we integrate music as a way to show this student as being intellectually capable and intellectually competent in a way that separates him or her from their peers. Using music, using their ability to speak. In fact, I remember um, interviewing some Jehovah Witnesses and the the, the, the kinds of experiences that the, the religion of, G, of, of that particular belief system ex, exposed them to in terms of how to speak well, that kind of characteristic or that kind of experience was then translated into them having higher scores on the SAT in the verbal section. And so using it as an asset bot, uh, model as opposed to one that is more deficit oriented is the way to go. So that's cultural capital, and that work is something that um, is a lot of research out there and ones that I would encourage you to, to pursue. And again, this first book that was many years ago called School Matters, Why African American Students Need Multiple Forms of Capital. Thank you all so, so much. I know we're at time. I, I, I know we're at time. So I, I thank you for sharing space with us and connect with us during lunch. I'd like to chat. Y'all have a good one. Thank you. Thank you, Charmaine. Thank you so much.